like to thank you for having me here today. Um, give me a chance to talk about what's actually my favourite topic at the moment, which is what I call unneighbourliness. And that's about the kind of more dysfunctional aspects of relationships between neighbours. And Alex invited me here, and I know that he's part of um, a practical justice initiative. So it's really um, got me thinking about the kind of justice um, components of neighbour problems. And as I get towards the end, you'll see how some of the kind of the inequities of neighbour problems really play out. And what um, um, kind of um, government organisations in particular um, are trying to do to assist um, people in managed problems because it's becoming quite a significant problem. So I want to thank Alex for having me and thank you for coming, particularly at four o'clock on a Thursday. I'd like to acknowledge my contributors um, with whom I could not do this research and you'll see why I couldn't do without them as we progress. So, of course, you can't talk about neighbours without a picture of Scott and Charlene, and there's a lot of research about... In fact, there's loads of research that's been going on for decades about neighbouring and, the, and the, um, the benefits of having good relationships with neighbours. And the thing about neighbours is really that there's nothing special or unique um, about the relationship. Neighbours are simply defined in terms of physical proximity. They are quite simply the people who live near us. But there are certain normative expectations associated with being a neighbour. And those expectations very broadly are that neighbours are friendly, that they're helpful, but they also respect your privacy. And so good and bad notions of neighbouring have often been seen to hinge on those. There's been a lot of work, a lot of really large surveys about um, neighbouring and the kind of um, psychosocial benefits you get from those good relationships with neighbours. And research has shown, you can see from the 1980s, that they're a really important form of local support, particularly at times in need, and particularly for those whose lives are more locally oriented, such as um, mothers at home, older people, and, uh, and people on a low income. More recently, particularly um, following the floods in, um, and the bushfires in Australia, there's been a lot more work and thinking about the role that neighbours play in fostering what we, you know, we know as disaster resilience and the, way they can, um, the role they can play both as um, a warning strategy for neighbours and as first responders in a disaster. And criminologists have done a lot of work on fear of crime and the importance of neighbouring in fostering what they call collective efficacy, the ability of neighbours to respond to problems and reducing fear of crime. And of course, health researchers have shown that um, having good relationships with your neighbours enhances your sense of well-being, sense of community, neighbourhood satisfaction. And there's some kind of more flimsy work that actually talks about actual health benefits with regards to um, you know, reducing your likelihood of you know, heart disease or whatever. But I think that kind of work often sticks um, health with well-being. Um, grand sociological theory does tell us that our relationships with our neighbours are changing, and we might actually experience that in our own lives in terms of the changing relationships we have with neighbours as time goes on. We've got increasing mobility and privatisation, which means, and this goes back to the early work of Goldthorpe and Lockwood on the privatised worker, where our lives become more homebound, more focused, and we're, we're thought to know our neighbours less than we used to, such that neighbours are now strangers living side by side. And this seems to come to the foreign media reports when we find that, you know, we hear stories about people who've lain dead in their houses or apartments for six months and neighbours didn't even know um, or think that there was a problem and, you know, we're all kind of Bridget Jones who are worried about being found half-eaten by an Alsatian um, so many months after having died. Now, these are sort of um, broad social structural processes of sociological change, but also urban, um, urban and housing policies change the way we live and relate with neighbours, such that increasing the density of cities can have an impact upon relationship with neighbours and also development, things like, um, um, you know, kind of um, regeneration areas and gentrification can impact upon who we live next to and how we relate to them. Anecdotally, councils that I work with tell us that there is an increasing volume of complaints about neighbours and that it's becoming a real problem for them in dealing with neighbour complaints. And they're trying to find ways of encouraging people to resolve neighbour problems without going to council because many of the problems they believe could be resolved before it gets to council because complaining about your neighbour actually quite often enhances problems between neighbours. 
And many of the problems they actually encounter are what they would call vexatious, where they become tit for tat. So I complain about Alex's dog, and he starts to then complain that the palms in the front of my house are too big, and, and so it goes on. Because smell something burning. Yeah. No. <coughs> Is somebody's toast or is the heating on too high? Toast, Okay. And, and it's also suggested, although there's no empirical evidence um, in support of this yet, that if we don't know our neighbours, then we lack the social basis to resolve tensions informally. The idea is that we're less likely to go to our neighbour about an issue um, if we don't know who they are. But there is no actual evidence yet to suggest that's the case. There's been no work that kind of correlates... Um, knowledge of neighbours with the propensity to approach them if there are problems. And in fact, a lot of the work that we're doing qualitati qualitatively show that people have problems with neighbours even when the relationship's been really good from the start. So that's something that we do need to look at. So what we're arguing is that not all forms of neighbouring are positive. And this seems to come to the fore most in in the kind of popular discourses and the media rather than academic research. There's not a lot of academic research on the kind of more negative side of neighbouring, but there's plenty in the newspapers of neighbour problems that have escalated out of hand. Um, there's <coughs> occasionally, there's articles on hate thy neighbour. And I was asked to um, give a comment to the Courier Mail a couple of years ago on neighbour problems and I was happy to do that and they said we'd like a photograph of you and I was happy to do that and they said just stand there with your arms folded to try and look like authoritative and I, <laughs> and I did that and then when it came out it's got hate thy neighbour and there's me with <laughs> like you know Linda Cheshire hates her neighbours but the thing that made me happy is that the cat snuck in the photo <laughs> that was the best bit of it um, for me but it's it's kind of serious like people can die or lose limbs over neighbour um, disputes. I just have to tell you the situation I'm living. I'm, I'm having trouble with the one next to me as, as a serious conflict. I just go about my business. Um, it's impacting my life. I'm fortunate this person's behaving very hysterical and taking complaints about the apartment housing. I feel I don't want to get involved in it. And just has it in for me when I just go about my lifestyle and I just don't deserve to be picked on that sort of thing there. Yeah. We, shows, will, really. we will get to some yeah, of that. Yeah, I wanted to talk, Absolutely. I to talk further about it. And I suspect a lot of people have a neighbour story, which is... Um, it shows, huh? Yes. In fact, I have my own neighbour story, but I won't share it for now. Um, so, as I said, there's a lot of kind of popular engagement with the idea of um, problematic neighbours. There's a website, there we are, there's a website, um, neighboursfromhell.com.au, that assist you in dealing with neighbours from hell. And it does say, quite fairly, if you've come here looking for methods of revenge, you've probably come to the wrong place, and it's probable that it's you who is or about to become the neighbour from hell. So this is actually trying to help people manage um, problems. There's also Neighbours from Hell in Britain, um, a more professional website, I might note. <laughs> you know, more kind of... <laughs> slightly more dignified than that one, perhaps. But... <laughs> um, so they're, they're there to assist. There's um, a TV show, which I've never seen, if anyone wants to see. It's a New Zealand um, show, Neighbours from Hell. It's so successful. They're on <laughs> series two. Um, there's a, um, a computer game, Neighbours from Hell. Revenge is a sweet game. Um, and then there's Neighbours from Hell 2 on vacation. So, you know, it's kind of like it's amusing, but as you'll see, we, there really is quite a serious side to it later. And, um, in fact, governments, so in Queensland, the Department of Justice and Attorney General are trying to help people manage um, neighbour problems. And some of the most common ones are things like fences and trees. So it's actually been coming up with new acts to help people resolve uh, fences and dispute trees um, by giving some really clear guidelines. And I'm sure there are similar um, acts in New South Wales. So... Problems between neighbours, we're arguing, is that um, they are a significant policy issue. But we don't really know the impact of problematic neighbours. There's all that research about the good, the kind of positive impacts of relationships with neighbours, but very little about what it means if those relationships are, are difficult. And there's a lot of um, kind of attempts by community organisations to emphasise the value of good relationships with neighbours. We've got Good Neighbour Day where you can have a, a street party or a community garden, but there's not really a lot of research on that. So with my colleagues, we've been um, developing a programme of work on the negative side of neighbouring, 
And the kind of guiding questions that we're asking are what are the nature, causes and outcomes of neighbour problems? How do they vary across different suburban contexts? As a way of understanding the kind of structural urban and policy processes like gentrification, urban consolidation and urban renewal and how they shape um, relationships with neighbours. How problems between neighbours arise and how they're managed in the context of neighbouring relationships and interactions more broadly. So you can't really think about problems between neighbours in isolation of the broader practices of neighbouring that take place on a day everyday level. And what a dispute with a neighbour might mean as a result might mean for those relationships as well as how those relationships themselves shape the way that you deal with um, problems. We've come up with this concept of unneighbourliness and we're wondering, is it simply the reverse of neighbourliness? If neighbourliness is about being friendly, helpful and respecting privacy, do problems arise when those kind of normative expectations are breached? And what we're finding is actually that's not the case. We need to develop the concept of unneighbourliness inductively from the kind of pro um, problems that people encounter and then thinking about how that relates to neighbouring and neighbourliness. And so that's our final question. What do problems between neighbours tell us about neighbouring in contemporary suburban life more broadly? So it's quite a programme, a large programme of work. And we've been using multiple data sources um, to look at different aspects of that. The one I'm presenting on today is the first thing we're able to do is we added survey items on neighbour problems to an existing um, um, survey. It was a longitudinal survey of um, Brisbane neighbourhoods called the Australian Community Capacity Study. Um, it's about 4,000 residents in 146 neighbourhoods in Brisbane and we were able to add about 15 questions about neighbour problems to that survey. We also work with the dispute resolution branch of um, Queensland Department of Justice and Attorney General and they've given us their neighbour mediation cases from 99 to 2014. And these are the disputes that actually become serious enough that people need mediation. And I'll show you what the data set looks like um, a bit later. We've also, after three year conversation with the Brisbane City Council, they've given us their entire complaints data set from 2007 to 2014. And they've just given us an extra um, three years where we're able to examine complaints to council about neighbours um, the data set is around 450,000 um, cases, but they're often calls for service. And we've had a very elaborate kind of spatial mapping activity to extract neighbours, which we've defined by physical proximity from that. And we've got about 111,000 neighbour problems. And the good thing about that data set is that it actually allows us to look at urban change and we can look at way neighbourhood change over time influences relationships with neighbours. And then we've got street studies in um, neighbourhoods where we've done 60 interviews to date and we've done interviews with clients of dispute resolution. They're the people that have the most acute problems. So what we found so far at a very brief level is that in our survey of the community capacity survey, 64% um, of respondents reported that they had been annoyed or bothered by some aspect of a neighbour. We kept open the definition of neighbour, so it was really up to them what a neighbour was, but 64% said they'd been annoyed or bothered. And annoyed or bothered, which means that the neighbour may not even know they're a problem, it may or may not be deliberate, and it may or may not ever have resulted in a complaint, um, let alone mediation. We found that 42% of all of those annoyances um, were reported to feature some form of antisocial or criminal conduct. And I'll explain in just a minute what I mean by that. And we found some patterns in the data. And the one that I want to focus on today is that neighbourhood concentrated disadvantage increased the likelihood of residents reporting antisocial or criminal conduct upon neighbours. And in a more recent paper, we've also found out that processes of gentrification and urban consolidation make residents twice as likely to make a complaint to council about a neighbour as not. Um, so this is the breakdown of the problems people generally experience. Noise is a significant one. These won't be any surprise to you. Noise, domestic animals, what, what um, respondents considered unruly or antisocial behaviour, unsightly or messy properties, boundary problems, parking, odours, invasion of privacy, damage to property, 
physical abuse, illegal or unsafe building structures and other. And 35% had encountered no problems. And we actually need to spend more time looking at the people and the neighbourhoods where there are no problems and understand what's going on there. So what we've, also, we've then done is we tried to classify neighbour problems into two types. And the first type is what we've called private nuisance problems. Things like noise, pets, trees, boundary issues, disputes. And really they're about those kind of problems, as it says here, that occur in the domestic setting of the home and are where the, the use and enjoyment of one's home is believed to be affected by a neighbour in some way, deliberately or otherwise. It may be subject to local laws or legislative instruments like noise um, or trees, but not always. And it may or may not lead to the formulation um, of a neighbour complaint or dispute. And then we've identified antisocial and criminal behaviour. And you, of course, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the literature on antisocial behaviour. The concept itself is problematic. It's very imprecisely defined, but it's broadly um, lies on a spectrum from low levels of nuisance like litter and so-called unruly children to harassment, vandalism, and then more serious and criminal acts of burglaries and muggings. And we found from the data that the kind of problems people experienced were, here's our, um, here's our no problems. And then we found that 37% of our sample encountered private nuisance problems on their own, meaning it was all that low level domestic kind of um, stuff. But then we found that you know, nearly 27% encountered private nuisance problems in concert with what they considered to be um, antisocial and criminal behaviour. Interestingly, we found no, there were like 3% of cases reported antisocial criminal behaviour at the hands of a neighbour in isolation of private nuisance problems. And what that means is that when we find this kind of combined, it means either that problematic neighbours are problematic in a number of ways, or it means that if unresolved private nuisance problems escalate into something more serious, or that neighbourhoods in general are made up of constellation of all sorts of neighbours causing all sorts of high or low level problems. But then we, um, and these are the kind of, so when we go to the mediation data, these are the sorts of private nuisance issues that people talk about that actually lead to mediation. And I won't read them out loud to you um, for the issue of time, but you can see this is about a tree dispute and this is one about dogs and she states our neighborhood is going to the dogs please investigate now of course mediation don't investigate they actually try and help people um, resolve their issues but these are sorts of private issue private nuisance issues that i'm um, referring to i'll move on this is antisocial um, behavior really with regards to physical abuse threats and harassment. And you can see really that the kind of um, experiences people are talking about here are quite profound, quite scary, quite threatening. And these are genuine cases, you know, being threatened, threatening children with violence. Um, here, I think one of them, they says, um, A says B has told her he would only have to spend a few years in prison if he killed her. He's threatened her with violence. He's threatened the children, um, throwing chemicals on clothes, verbal abuse, has, you know, children are being threatened. It's, it's pretty nasty um, stuff. Now, well, I want to get to the kind of inequities of this in terms of, the, um, in terms of the people who are most likely to experience these kinds of problems. And what we found from our research is that if you live in a disadvantaged suburb, you're more likely to encounter private nuisance problems with antisocial and criminal behaviour than to encounter nuisance problems alone. Now, this is where my colleagues really come to the fore because I'm a qualitative researcher, and yet here I am presenting the results of multinomial, multi-level -regre regression modelling. So if you've got any questions about the methods, I might have to write them down and, um, and, and get back to you. What we've had a look is the kind of neighbourhood context of how people experience problems, and there is quite significant variance among neighbourhoods that show a clustering of particular problems in particular neighbourhoods. And we controlled for the individual characteristics of the respondents with regards to their own age, their tenure and their income. 
but the kind of neighbourhood characteristics we looked at were concentrated disadvantage, residential mobility and population density. Now, if anyone likes stats, this is the first part of the table and it's about the odds of encountering one set of problems relative to another. So contrast one is about the, the odds, if you live in a particular neighbourhood, the odds of encountering no problems versus the odds of encountering nuisance and crime. And the data is actually a bit back to front because what this says is that if you live in a disadvantaged suburb, the odds of encountering no problems are, are lower than your odds of encountering combined nuisance and crime problems, which if you flip it around says basically if you live in a disadvantaged suburb, you're more likely to encounter combined nuisance and crime than no problems. And you can see mobility has an effect. Um, interestingly, immigration and non-English concentration has an effect, but in the other direction. That actually if you live in a diverse suburb, you are less likely to encounter combined nuisance and crime problems than no problems. And the results are pretty much the same when we look at nuisance only versus combined nuisance and crime. It's the same kind of thing. You're more likely to encounter nuisance and crime than nuisance only if you live in a disadvantaged suburb. And what we found actually is that the odds of encountering no problems versus nuisance only problems, there's no um, difference between them, meaning that in every suburb, the likelihood of having no problems versus nuisance only cannot be predicted on the basis of where you live. And it might be that, you know, neighbouring literally rests on a kind of knife edge of good and bad where it doesn't take much to nip, to turn good neighbouring into bad. So just to summarise, disadvantaged mobile and highly dense suburbs all have higher odds of the combined nuisance problems than no problems. Here's our NESP concentrations. And disadvantaged suburbs also have higher odds of encountering combined nuisance crime than nuisance only. So how can we understand this? If there are any criminologists in the room, they would start to talk about social disorganisation. And they might say that in neighbourhood... Now, most of this, this theory comes from the US, um, where there are very disadvantaged suburbs and also racially segregated ones. And they would argue that in suburbs where you've got low economic resources, low and high instability, often through, um, through private rental, you get this state of social disorganisation where residents are unable to impose social control. They argue that there are lower levels of collective efficacy in neighbourhoods where people are low income, people don't know their neighbours, they're fearful of their neighbours and you, um, you get um, higher problems. That's what criminologists argue. Research on neighbouring shows that low income residents often have more intense relationships with affluent groups. They actually know fewer of their neighbours, but they know them more intimately, whereas affluent groups know more neighbours, but only have very fleeting and weak ties. And so the argument has been, um, or the, the research has suggested, that lower income residents have a tendency to confront neighbours, whereas in high income suburbs, there's what, what Baumgart has called a moral minimalism. And that is, um, moral, mi moral minimalism is really about there's an impression of civility and harmony in the neighbourhood where people wouldn't lower themselves to fight with their neighbours because that would be uncivil. But the problem is that that occurs because of weak ties in the neighbourhood, meaning that people don't know their neighbours, they don't want to get to know them, but they don't want to disrupt the harmony of the neighbourhood. So while that might be seen as all very civil, there's actually no foundation for good neighbourly relationships at all in those suburbs. So in fact, a tendency to confront problem neighbours might be a good thing if it's seen to rest on stronger ties and, and social support. And of course, as good sociologists, we would really be looking for more structural causes of what's going on in lower income neighbourhoods. And we would really have a look at the kind of urban and housing market processes that have a tendency to concentrate low-income um, disadvantaged groups into certain areas of the city. And in particular, we're looking at, if we're thinking about social housing and the way social housing tenants are now concentrated, such that you may be more likely to find problems. And that's what I want to turn to just in the last... How long have I got? Ten minutes, Corona? 
um, just to show you about some of the kind of inequities of, um, of problems between neighbours for those people who are really most vulnerable in society. And what we found by looking at the dispute resolution data is that if you're a social housing tenant, you're twice as likely as a non-social housing tenant to have a dispute with a neighbour that involves physical abuse, threats and harassment. And the data that we've used to analyse this is from uh, the dispute resolution branch um, that I showed you, those 3,000 cases we had earlier. And what we literally did, quite manually, is identify all cases where one or more party was revealed as a social housing tenant. And we did this because this is what the data set looks like from dispute resolution. There's, um, you know, each column is about the dispute type, how they heard of it, where they live, the relationship length, the kind of behaviours. But there's what also happens with these cases is when people ring dispute resolution and say, I've got a problem with a neighbour, the person on the end of the telephone or at the counter says, OK, tell me about that. And they explain what's going on and they literally write it down. So we've got qualitative fields that look like this. This is party A. And party A is like, this is what's been happening to me. Party B, or sometimes there's even C and D, they respond. We've got 5,000 pages of qualitative text mm -hmm. on disputes between neighbours. And so what we did is we searched in all of these for any reference to social housing tenants. And that might be because people were saying things like um, they were referring to the department, they were referring to housing in capital letters, they were referring to terms like... Um, what did Department of Housing used to be called? Commission, Housing Commission, HC, the Department, Tenants. And we found 236, which is probably a significant underreport, but they're only the ones that, where people explicitly made reference to either themselves or their dis, you know, a disputing neighbour being social housing. And what we found from the um, data is that most of the disputes seem to be occurring between tenants in areas of concentrated social housing. So the disputes were between social housing tenants rather than between a social housing tenant and an owner-occupier or private um, renter. And it looks like in many cases these are people who live in medium density apartment blocks rather than freestanding homes. And you'll see that in some of the data. So this is the data set. So there's a lot of literature on the poor neighbours of social housing. And um, social housing tenants are unfairly stigmatised as the kind of worst neighbours that you can get. And this has really been a kind of result of media beat-ups and government policy. Antisocial behaviour in the UK was very much targeted at social housing and problem estates. And so social housing and neighbour problems um, are seen through the lens of antisocial behaviour in a way that they don't when you encounter problems with neighbours in private um, rental or home ownership. There have been a lot of harsh policy responses coming from Queensland. We know better than most about the policy responses to do with antisocial behaviour. We had the three strikes policy um, where you get a strike for every problem, including a dispute with a neighbour, and you get three strikes and then you're out. And luckily that's changed with a change of government. I think housing researchers, um, and Alan would know this, recognise that um, antisocial behaviour is a legitimate policy concern. When you see some of the data, people are really doing it tough at the hands of neighbours, as you've um, explained to me. But we need to have conversations about this without stigmatising tenants as a category. And we would argue that many of the problems are linked to social housing policy and the so-called residualisation of social housing, where social housing has diminished now to less than 4% of all housing in Australia. And of course, waiting um, lists are high. There's, what, 50,000, 30,000 in New South Wales alone, 60,000, 60, 15,000 in Queensland. The only way housing providers can manage that kind of overwhelming um, need is by having an allocations policy based on high need. So the, the greater your need, the more likely you are to get um, social housing, which means, of course, that really it ends up populating or accommodating people who have um, some of the more complex problems. And this was, it's back in 2012, but this is the allocation of social housing 
um, in Queensland and you can see that 67% of all housing goes to people with very high need, meaning not only low income but mental health challenges, drug and alcohol abuse, family um, breakdown. Um, high need is 27, moderate is 5 and low is 0.68. So we're concentrating high needs groups in, um, in quite often in um, medium density housing. And there are also inappropriate housing allocations policies. If you're allocating people on the basis of need, you're not really taking into consideration the appropriateness of where you're putting them. And you'll see that in some of the data. And there's poor physical design that leads to the problems. High density, poor insulation, noise problems um, are high. So this is the analysis we did of the data, the dispute issues where we compared housing, social housing tenants and non-social housing tenants. And you'll see that physical abuse, threats and harassment, um, I think this was a number, so our oh, percentage, 70% of all of our cases of social housing had um, physical abuse identified as a, as part of the, as a factor. And it's a, you know, less than 40% in non-social housing. Um, noise is higher and then of course quite inevitably things like boundary issues are much lower because of you know the, the kind of lack of private ownership trees are lower um, process types this is just out of interest um, social housing tenants are having required to um, have mediation and quite often housing providers will insist on that because they don't really want to get embroiled in the problems uh, the dispute length you'll see that social housing tenants tend to have slightly longer disputes than non-social housing tenants. And that would be because the tenants, the um, tenure is quite a stable one where people remain in their homes for, for quite a long time because you, know, you work damn hard to get it, you're not gonna give it up. And that would be the same with the relationship length as well. You can see that they have longer relationships with their neighbors than non-social housing tenants. And third party involvement, police are involved in, you know, kind of just over 40% of cases. Again, not unexpectedly, they're less likely to go to council or courts, um, you know, because clearly they have less capacity um, to navigate the system. Um, okay, so the way social disadvantage contributes to disputes is really evident in the data. And we can see, for example, that there's frequent reference to mental health challenges, drug and alcohol problems in some of the accounts of, um, and this is just a very small excerpt. B says A is a violent drunk and she's frightened of him. And you can see the language people use to describe each other. People says A is unpredictable is schizo. A used to hit the grog. Um, B herself is in and out of the funny farm and B and says A has mental problem as indicated by the fact she wears woolen jumpers in hot weather. Um, also we see evidence of um, the conduct of a high needs tenant causing problems for those living nearby. So we've got this case here where a, an elderly neighbour can't get upstairs to his bathroom so he's urinating in the unit and it needs cleaning and it's unpleasant for his neighbours. This one is particularly profound and distressing that A says the music from B stereo is played on a daily basis at high volume. A states that um, both have health issues. B suffers schizophrenia and the loud music soothes B, but A has his own concerns and he needs peace and quiet. Then we've got poor building materials compound problems where even tenants say, look, the design of the building causes you to hear everything through walls. And there's also indications of problematic allocations policies where somebody gets marginalised because a block of units is really thought to be intended for elderly people and A's only 50. Um, so what's she doing there? Um, the other social justice issue is that social housing tenants are also more likely to encounter eviction as a result of neighbour disputes. Social housing providers um, are really clamping down quite heavily on problematic neighbours. They don't want to resolve disputes. They encourage people to go to mediation. But a lot of it is coming up where people say, look, we're going to be... So number one, they say, um, we will be evicted if we can't show that we're trying to improve our relationship with our neighbours. 
but also there is evidence of other tenants trying to evict a problematic tenant. And tenants will often complain of people ganging up on them and writing letters to kind of get them out. Um, they sign petitions to get each other evicted. So of course, homeowners have the luxury of deciding whether a problem with a neighbour is serious enough that they want to move. And many do. We see the evidence where people say, I don't want to live here anymore, I'm going to move house. But social housing tenants, A, don't have the luxury of moving away from a problematic neighbour. They might request a transfer. They're quite unlikely to get it. But also, they can actually be evicted if they're seen to be the problematic neighbour. So, just to finish, I want to have a quick look and talk about some of the work that's being done in recognition of the kind of challenges that um, disadvantaged groups face in managing neighbour problems. Not only are they more likely to encounter them and to encounter quite problematic um, forms of neighbour disputes, but they also quite often lack the resources to navigate systems appropriately where they can get help. And they certainly can't afford solicitors and courts can be challenging and difficult. Community legal centres in Queensland are overwhelmed with cases of people having problems with neighbours and needing help and not knowing where to go. So what they've done is they've set a website to try and assist people um, manage, particularly low income people who can't afford legal as assistance, to manage neighbourhood disputes. And they've got a whole website they've recently um, developed with hints on how to resolve disputes by talking to neighbours and a whole series of templates to assist with writing to neighbours if you feel that you can't approach them. And you can say, hi, I live at number whatever and you know, you're making a bit of noise to try and resolve it without too much antagonism. Interestingly, I was also, I don't know if any of you know what a hackathon is. Um, I was involved in a hackathon organised by Department of Justice and Attorney General back in May. Um, and this is where you, try, you come up with a legal problem and for two days you get students and junior um, uh, lawyers and IT people to come and brainstorm a way of solving a problem. And the one that they looked at this year was called Access to Justice, Helping Resolve Neighbourhood Disputes. So it was about promoting safe and peaceful communities by helping neighbours resolve their disputes. And it was recognition again that people have differential access to the legal system and they're trying to get justice available for all groups. So um, I set up the problem um, with a presentation similar to this. The students worked with, um, a, with um, some industry experts and the prize was they get a four week contract with Justice and Attorney General to develop a solution. And um, I've been working with the students, they're doing it all, I just um, meet with them now and then to advise them. And they've come up, this students and IT students, they've come up with a chat bot. I don't know if any of you heard of a chat bot, I think it's a kind of um, blend between a robot and something you can chat with. And it's where you can receive tailored information about your neighbour problem. Um, and they argue that it can be accessed at any time, it helps reduce strain on current, current government resources, it can, okay, so this was how they pitched it to the Queensland government, and then you can divert your resources to more important issues. But it was also a way of giving people easy access um, and an educational tool. And this is what they've developed so far. It's, they're a group of young people and it's quite clever. Okay. You can tell it's young people because they're not even using capitals. <laughs> <laughs> but it's accessible language for anyone. So this will be, you know, your, your texting. <laughs> 
So this is what they're developing. I have no idea if this will make a difference and support people, but it's a really um, innovative idea where they are trying to make um, you know, legal support and justice much more available um, to, to people who presently don't have access. So with that, I'm just going to finalise by acknowledging all the people that, um, that help with this research. And of course, if you want further reading, here's reference to some of our papers, but um, there's plenty more um, on this and there's a lot more work to do as well. So thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I would be very glad to take them. Oh, and you need to use the um, mic because it's being recorded. <laughs> um, thanks for that. That was a really good synthesis of lots of different data sets and different types of data. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, I was just curious about the, um, the data that had come up around the um, immigration and English as a second language. Just, I, it's kind of a bit of an aside, but I guess we're in a context at the moment where there's an assumption that immigration is a threat to the social fabric of Australia and we've seen some events in the late last week that have communicated that. Does that correspond with other, other, kind of, other kinds of data in this area around say that the threat of immigration on, on good neighbourliness or is that something that could be used to try and destigmatise some of the public assumptions about immigration? Yeah and maybe but there are two competing explanations for the way people relate to neighbours in um, ethnically diverse neighbourhoods. And one is this sense of hunkering down, Robert Putnam's kind of work where he says, and he thinks about you know, the idea of kind of white Anglo-Saxons living in ethnically diverse neighbourhoods and they have a tendency to hunker down and only interact with people who are like them. So there are very little neighbourly neighbor interactions, including reported problems or complaints. Um, then there's um, the kind of contrast of that, which is a sense of like rubbing along together, where everybody's new, everybody has different kind of normative expectations and practices, and that it actually does create a sense of harmony um, in the neighbourhood. Now we don't, what we don't know, and I think this is something we could do from the data, is that shows that people, and it, it's interesting actually because that data set was about annoyances and nuisance, not about complaints. So people are less annoyed or bothered by their neighbours in ethnically diverse neighbourhoods. So that can only be a good sign, right? Because this isn't even about um, this isn't even about um, that kind of Baumgartner um, um, civility idea, because it's just like, do they annoy you? So yes, I guess it could, but what we don't know and we need to know is, what is the relationship like with neighbours in general? Do they know their neighbours? Do they interact with their neighbours? And does that impact upon whether they're annoying or not? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Did your study also check up and see in the whole world? <laughs> well, it's because it's not for everyone. Yeah, for in the whole world. Um, whether, where, where does Australia stand as good neighbours or bad neighbours? Good question. That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if there are global studies of neighbouring, and of course, the only way you can do those comparisons is by having consistent measures. Because some, you know, people ask questions differently. I think Australia, so what I do know is Australians move house on average every five years. So um, we are really quite a, un unstable is not the word, but there's a lot of mobility. Um, the truth is, I, actually, I don't know. There is work done on neighbouring in sort of developing countries and also countries like Hong Kong and China where we're seeing a lot of growth and development. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, the last question was on the chat box. Do you actually give your names or is it some fictitious name that you give when you're chatting? It would be entirely up to you. They do want to, um, they want to make sure that nobody feels they're handing over confidential information. Exactly. So they've had a conversation about, because they need to know where somebody lives in order to know which council 
Um, and they were initially going to say, what's your address? But that might make people, you know, worrying about providing confidential information, which is why they've gone to um, postcode. I think they could go to suburb. So you don't, you wouldn't have to say your name. It's, per, it's entirely anonymous. Hi. Um, the strategies you've mentioned, for example, um, templates um, and strategies for talking to your neighbours on the City of uh, Brisbane website, um, and also, for that matter, the chatbot, um, seem to be addressing the personal rather than the antisocial criminal activity. Um, any strategies to deal with that one? Um, and perhaps more seriously, is it really fair to expect neighbours to um, adopt some kind of strategy themselves to deal with issues at that level of seriousness when the causes are to do with placement, density, um, just the lack of so social housing positions resulting in people um, with very serious problems. Um, uh, I probably should say, I come to this as a member of the public, I'm chair of the Woolloomooloo Neighbourhood Advisory Board, so I see, and I have been for more than 10 years, so the examples I see are to do with that, and it seems that the situation has got more serious, um, and... <laughs> I've done pathetic things on behalf of the neighbourhood board, <laughs> such as writing to Housing New South Wales and suggesting that they don't put such a strong concentration <laughs> of people with high level, particularly drug use and drug dealing problems together. And they just write back to say, you know, we're terribly supportive of everybody. <laughs> and they, they don't actually commit to anything of that sort. And, and I understand it's because they've got no choice. Mm. There just aren't enough housing places. Anyway, do you think there's an answer that is a bit more hopeful than that? Oh, crikey, that's a big answer. <laughs> so, I mean, of course, as sociologists, we constantly talk about structure and agency, yes. and we don't want to deny the existence of either. So structurally, you're absolutely right. You know, many of the problems that we encounter, not only in social housing, but um, in high density and gentrifying areas, are to do with things like um, poor planning, um, you know, um, cheap building materials, particularly in social housing, that compound the problem, and then you've got the allocations policy with social housing. On the other hand, I think social housing providers are trying to at least give their tenants the skills to negotiate problems before they become too problematic. And I think I'm not... Um, I'm not insensitive to, um, to the importance of that, of giving people the skills to somehow negotiate problems. But it is much more complex, and there's a lot of work on sustaining tenancies in trying to recognise that you know, the, the problems with neighbours is a result of those complex problems, and that rather than turf people out, what you need to do is to work with them and provide them with um, sort of wraparound support. So there's a lot going on, both in terms of planning and design, in terms of housing providers, and in terms of you know, providing support for people so they can have mediation. But that's a matter of funding as well. Yeah. Because the um, community services officers, mm. um, somebody threw in the, a point that in some places overseas, all community services officers or equivalent positions had social work degrees. And the answer that came back was it wouldn't really matter whether they had a social work degree because each CSO was dealing with hundreds of, of mm -hmm. uh, cases of households. They simply don't have the time to do the kind of work. So what the they... skills are a tiny bit irrelevant. What they can do, what they do, and in Queensland, what they've done is target those people whose tenancies are at risk as a result of these and other problems. And they've provided um, social work support, um, individual tenancy plans. And it was, a, it, was, it was a project rather than a program, because projects don't endure. It was a pilot. Mm 
But the results after 18 months showed that problems between neighbours were reduced among those people who'd been part of that problem. But it was a very intensive, individualised tenancy support programme. Mm -hmm. But it worked. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about kicking people out. Um, yes, I just wanted to, um, to query the point about the um, Department of Housing having no choice about how much housing they actually could provide. Because, in fact, they just they sell off housing. Um, Miller's Point, where I lived for 13 years in public housing, sold off holus bolus, the building I was in. I, when, I didn't mean you know, that. No, but, but what I mean is if they, if they believed in what they were doing, if they, I mean, I understand that it's about what comes from Treasury, but if they put up a better case, um, and I think the other thing that happened is that housing was never on the political agenda and then it started to slowly creep on the political agenda because of the, of the um, in, in relation to Department of Housing and, and Community Housing and Aboriginal Housing because it was, um, um, it was so obvious that, the, that there was a huge list building up and that there were, there were um, concentrations of people with um, serious high needs living together and that that was you know, inevitably going to be problematic. Um, but then suddenly it was all about you know young people and avocado toast and mortgages and you know generational um, inequities and somehow the social housing stuff just fell off the agenda in terms of housing. So I, I just think, I just think you know like I still feel very very cross with them. <laughs> and I, I just think that and they talk about well we did this so that we could um, build other units in less. Um, in less salubrious places than Miller's Point, say, um, and, and therefore cre increase the number. But it just goes back to the ghetto system, and I don't even think they've, I don't even think the numbers match. Thank you, yeah. Yes. Yeah, just where I currently live in Department of Housing, um, St George um, is going to take over in April next year. So that would be a good thing because they, they have more power to deal with this all this behaviour problem that's coming around there now. There's been, it was, it's been it hasn't been doing any good for the department housing to deal with it. So we need to see what the next phase will be. Good luck. Yeah. I have I have I've also put in for a transfer and they approved for my application January this year. After I've had um a few knocks back before. Awesome. I tried mutual exchange and nobody didn't want it. So, mm. so thankfully I got help to get this um application. So it take would take about twelve to eighteen months to on me the private property. Mm. Good luck. I mean, I think the, f the fact is that, you know, we don't want to stigmatise social housing tenants and this, the intention of this discussion is not to do that. But we also need to recognise that some people have very traumatic experiences at the hands of difficult neighbours and we need to sort of help support yeah, those it's people. Been and many years and yeah. I'm not impressed by the complaints. I mean, they just want to take advantage of a go. I mean, they're very sensitive about it. Good luck. Mm -hmm. It's been a policeman at times to deal with that. So we've got one question here, and if we have time, which I think I'll keep my answers short. Yeah. Yes and no, please. Okay. <laughs> no. Hi there. That was a great <laughs> presentation, and thank you. I just wanted to ask. Um, I know the Redfern Waterloo area is kind of in a process of, in the future, maybe there's going to be a mass um, gentrification of that area. I'm wondering what you know of. Have there been instances of that kind of mass gentrification? What um, literature is there around how to manage, I guess, what I perceive is going to be an influx of neighbourhood disputes? Ooh. So, yes. Um, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, this one, um, how gentrification and densification influence the prevalence of problems between neighbours. Yes. Um, suburbs that have above average um, growth rise in the arrival of high income educated um, residents increases the odds of encountering complaints to council. What we don't know, and I'll keep this quick, sorry Alex, what we don't know is who's complaining about who. Mm. So we don't know if it's the gentrifiers complaining about the incumbent working class or about each other or even that the incumbents are complaining about the newcomers. How to manage that I, I don't know and I couldn't talk about it in the short time I've got left, but it's an issue. Knowing it's an issue means that we could, you know, planners, councils, community organisations could think in advance about how that might be 
done, like, I don't know, I'm talking off the top of my head now, meet and greets, get to know your neighbours is a start. I don't... There should be two more, because I missed one. I'm sorry. I apologise. Failure is a um, I was just wondering if you have any data from 20 years ago or 50 years ago that shows mm. the change in that. Yeah. No. Mm. No, but ask me in 30 years' time <laughs> <laughs> if I'm still here and I go, oh my God, we've got. Because the data just started being collected by council into, you know. The thing about administrative data is it's never collected for research purposes mm. and they change systems and no. One last question. Sure. Uh, no, it's going to be a tricky one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think with social housing tenants, obviously there's uh, there are a lot of um, very positive aspects in terms of neighbouring. So obviously the residualisation has really you know, impacted dramatically. But in my own research on the list point, for example, I mean, there were very, very intense neighbourly relations which enabled people to age in place. You know, people looked out for each other. Um, people assisted people when they were ill, etc., etc. So, <coughs> so I think um, that's very important. Obviously, the issue of uh, uh, limited fluidity very important. You know, people having similar historical um, you know, lives, etc. And I think the other thing about uh, physical structure is very important. You know, the compactness and that whole Jane Jacobs, is, you know. Informal contacts, constant contact, the mm. role of the pub, etc., etc., and of course with the more middle class people, I mean the plots are a lot bigger, so you know there's less contact, etc. Yeah, look, I agree with everything you've said, and and you're, if had I had more time and had this only been about social housing, I would have absolutely addressed your point about the sort of positive social capital. But this paper here antisocial or intensively sociable mm -hmm. is exactly that. It's about people have very intense relationships which are positive, like there's a lot of support, um, but sometimes they spill over into, into disputes that people don't know how to manage. Perfect timing and thank you, Linda. Thank you.